Hello, everybody, and welcome back to Between Two Fans. You are joined by fan number one, Daniel Scott, and fan number two, Stevie. This is your one-stop shop as a South African sports fan for everything that is going on. We're going to give you a Blitz Bulletin of the Week, so you don't have to do anything but listen to this and be in the no. Stevie, this week we are going to be going through the Rugby Championship, of course, the Boca taking on New Zealand at Innes Park, iconic. Then we're going to be speaking about the pro tiers and how they fared in West Indies. Of course, an introduction to the Paralympics, which is starting today on the day of recording, Wednesday, the 29th of August. And then we'll touch on the Premier League game week two and what we know all about that. Stevie, how are you doing today? Fine, sir. Yeah, busy, busy. It's been a busy week. Um, all Blacks on town. Um, I was there on Sunday for a little bit of a shake or session they had. I was there yesterday. Um, chatting to Mark Taleo. He's very excited to be back. Obviously, he's a consistent part of the African. Yeah, so it's, it's welcome back. His first game at Ellis Park this weekend. Um, chatting to Scott Hansen yesterday, taking over the attack role. Uh, obviously, the coach of Donald has left the All Blacks. A bit of... Uh, changes there as well which can be interesting um so the weather this week is looking absolutely gorgeous for saturday um yesterday uh, one of the all black players was, was being um, interviewed afterwards you know with kind of that pitch side vibe and they were like you know well, how's it feel and he's like yo the heat and the altitude it's just nuts bro i'm struggling to breathe here and so i think they've had a, a proper proper introduction to to the joburg weather in well, fact saturday is is going to be a lot colder than it is this week um it's going to be a high snowing 20. in cape town as we speak yeah. as well so, so hopefully it's going to be they, two extremes don't get them yeah. yeah but i think we are expecting very dry conditions on saturday so you know it should be pretty perfect for uh for for this game no absolutely and Steve, we are going to go through our predictions um, for the show. And for those who are new around here, this is the show where we make three predictions on three sporting matches of the weekend previously, or the ones coming up. And then Steve and I, there's going to be a forfeit at the end of it. The mm. current score, I believe, Stevie, 13 12. Correct? 13 12. And that was, that was with last week. So. We're going to go through the results this week, and it actually might be the end of the road for me um, because we're on the road to 15, and those, that who gets to 15 first, the other person needs to wear a sports shirt of the um, you know other fans choosing. So let's go through the predictions from this last week. First of all, it was South Africa versus West Indies, and the um, prediction was for the first game. Mine was a South Africa win by 15 runs or two wickets. Yours was a West Indies win by 15 or 30 runs or three wickets. And what's really disappointing is that I don't think any of the games my prediction would have come right. You know, I was no, thinking of maybe no. trying to wrangle you and say, oh, yeah, game two, well, that'll work. I was like, okay, no, game two, we lost again. Game three, okay, no, we lost all three games. So I think that's fair to say you won that um, an astounding lead. And then, of course, we went on to. Aston Villa versus Arsenal. The goal, the the result there was two 0 to um, Arsenal. Um, really getting away with a bit of murder after mm. some big misses and massive saves, um, keeping Arsenal in the game. So my prediction was one 0 Yours was two one. Stevie, we're split down the middle. Both yeah. one goal off. We both predicted the win. So we've spoken before this, and we're going to leave this as a as a tie. And yep. then we went for the Lions um, versus Cheetahs. And the predictions there were, um, or essentially the, cheat the Lions ended up winning by 17. Stevie, yours mm. was Lions by three. I mean, Lions by seven. Mine was Lions by three. Am I correct in saying, have you just got to 15 because of last week? Uh, I got to 14 from last week. And now you've won this week. I think you've just gone and won the whole thing. I've realized <laughs> that while I'm presenting this, because we, I hadn't added on last week, because we put it to a vote. There was a contentious one, and the fans spoke mm. on behalf of Stevie, which is, uh, you know, uh, I think still up for debate. But, you know, it's the, not up for debate, dude. The, the, the tribe That's... did speak, uh, and, you know, we do respect, or we try to respect democracy here. So that took you to 14 last week, and now that's just taking you to 15. So I've just lost. So you're going to have to figure out up until this point what type of jersey you want me to wear. 
Yeah, and, I'm about to start DMing some All Blacks fans, I reckon, in in London, especially ahead of the... the you, I imagine your next week is your home test. It's your, the Cape Town test versus the All Blacks. So you and an All Blacks jersey in that week could be oh. pretty brutal. Oh. Um, it also, I think, also depends on what happens on Sunday. Um, Liverpool United, if Knights were to beat <laughs> so, Liverpool... So depending Lapsed. on the result, it's either going to be an All Blacks yeah, or no, United. It's, it's going to have to be a results-based uh, decision here. Jeez, I can't believe I've just realized I've lost that after, you know, weeks, 30 weeks worth of predictions Moving and you finally come out on top. It was a hell of a ride, I tell you. We're probably going to have to shorten that down, you know, from 15 yeah. maybe to every five. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, but yeah, no, fair play, Stevie. I'll, I'll, I'll give that to you. And, um, you know, maybe a bit more head over heart. So, no, a lot of, lot of respect there. But Jeepers, that's going to be a tough look for next week. Um, so if you want to, Come see what I'm wearing. You're going to have to tune in on YouTube, but you'll, you'll see the dismay on my face regardless. Um, so I'm just going to wear this, um, you know, a fun shirt proudly while mm. I can. Stevie, let's jump into the big game this weekend, which is, of course, the rugby championship. And it is game week three. Now, of course, the South Africans have a um, five-point lead, having won both of our first games by um, bonus point versus Australia. Now we have two home games versus New Zealand and then two away games to Argentina. Some might say it's the perfect mix in this form format of the rugby championship and it's ours to lose. First game in Ellis Park, tell us how you're thinking and then we can get through the the, the lineup. Yeah, well, I think the lineup's a very interesting one. Um, I think we are going a bit all kind of all out attack, um, which which is interesting. I think at the end of the day, we've been looking to score tries this year. That has been a marked shift. We didn't do it against Ireland in the second test, but apart from that, we have looked like a team that can score tries, uh, or at least try and score tries. I think sometimes we could have been a lot more accurate. I think that's kind of been the story of our season so far. We played really well. We played some really nice games, but um, probably left a lot of points out there. Which if if we did get more accurate, I think we we got the potential to score a lot. But I think we have broken a record for scoring three tries with, in a row for the first time in how many years um so there's gonna be five five versus, with with five you know i think that it should be a high scoring affair on saturday to be perfectly honest i think both these teams have looked sometimes quite fragile um defensively um but both of them look very deadly on attack so i'm hoping we're going to see an absolute shit show of just tries <laughs> moments like yeah absolute i think it could be one of those like, it could be an all-timer to be honest yeah no i, I agree I, and i hope it is because it's also, you know, big revenge from their part post World Cup yeah. final. Of course, they actually have a really good track record at Ellis Park, so the Springboks are there to kind of settle the record on that one to be like, you know, a, I, I'm sick of you winning on our supposedly our mm. biggest stadium in the country, and also we want to win the Freedom Cup back. It's been over ten years now, and yeah. you know, the Freedom Cup to win it, you have to win both games because it's always the incumbent um, holder that wins it if it's a 1-1 one, one. and there have been lots of 1-1s one, um, yeah. over the years but 1-1s one, you know, or also once off for example um, which yeah. is enough it has to be a full 1-1 one, one. I mean the ironic thing is you've actually beaten them twice the last two times we played against them we've beaten them because yeah. we beat them this, and took them and we beat them be the first time that we would get that it would be three wins in a row versus the All Blacks if we yeah. are able to beat them and in three different um, countries first it was in um, Twickenham then it was in Stade de France, and now it would have been at Ellis Park. So history is there to be made. Let's get through the um, the lineup, Stevie. And, of course, the, the big talking points are the lack of locks, that crisis yes. that we have. We have the big selection of Sasha Gomezulu picked over Pollard, and then we have Grant Williams on the bench. Is he potentially the new Quacha? And then, of course, Apelele Fassi been picked over Villarou at 15. A lot of um, a lot kind of shown in the faith for Apelele Fassi and the growth he's had. And then Ben Jason Dixon starting at seven, which is massive for him. Also, this time last year, it was playing Curry Cup rugby. So some big names in that mix, Stevie. Let's, let's start off by going through a bit of our lock crisis. And as it mm. currently stands, Etzebeth has been ruled out for the first time in what feels like a millennia. Um, and we have Ruan Nokia and Peter Stepp Toy starting in the locks. Um, yeah, what are you thinking about the South African lock crisis? And with Nicholas Janssen from Rendsburg also available, why was he not picked? Yeah, it's an interesting one that he kind of came from the fringe. I mean, he was about such a weird lock career because he kind of came from nowhere. It was very unexpected when he came during the British and Irish Lions series, played one test, and then we never saw him again. 
you yeah. know. So it was it was quite it's quite a weird player to kind of fall to the wayside. So I think given the fact that he's obviously been in the setup before, was quite a good player to sort of get moved back to. I was quite surprised to look at like a Marvin Ori, for example. Um, but um, yeah, I also I'm desperate for Marvin Ori to come back. I'm really yeah, really glad it's, that it's, he's it's interesting kind of that, that they've the moved on from him. Um, but. In terms of the lockout, look, we wait to hear about Etzebeth. It's apparently a decision we made. He could yet feature. So we will have to have confirmation of that this evening. Um, there's, they've got their last main training session uh, this afternoon. If he comes through that all right, then he could potentially be involved in selection. Um, I think at the end of the day, you know, you look at the players there, and I think that that's – I personally would have gone with Peter Steff, the toy um, Nicholas Sanzer von Rensburg uh, combination. I think Rionok is a great player. Um, I think Nicholas Sanzer von Rensburg is – for me, probably a bit uh, ahead of him, in, in, but also we the kids been involved in the squad a bit more, has played a bit more recently with them, and and they're so systems based are the box. You know, very few players kind of just walk in and mm. suddenly walk into a side. They are very systems based. You kind of work your way through the system. Um, Which is why so, you see yeah. such massive squads in you know pre tournaments, yeah. you know, in these kind of box training camps. You know, people that haven't played and probably won't play for another two years or so. But how yeah. slowly involved in these caps, um, and Sasha, Sasha is an example of that. Yeah, I mean they've tracked him since he was under fifteen. You know, under fifteen they tracked him, under seventeen, under eighteen, Craven Reek, under. I mean, so they, it's incredible the system based uh, how the box are. So if in that respect, you know, similar for Apple Fassi, for example, he fell out of the system. He had to come back into the system. Now he's got an opportunity. He's got that chance. Now he's had to be ready to sort of use it. So I think you know a lot of that's probably is there. Is that uh, Runoki has been in the system before more recently. He's, he's played in the last couple of weeks. Um, mm. It's a big risk having no locks on the bench. Um, you know, we've got a oh, complete well, use, use has been made the official um, third lock. So because he played, I mean, he played a little bit of lock at the Cheaters, which I found out this week. But I mean, that will be pandemonium. If, I mean, if Jasper Vista is playing lock. We, yeah, really I mean, look, you've got Jasper Vista and you've got Ben point. Jason Dixon. So you've got, as always, you've got options. Um, yeah, it goes so... again to show that versatility <laughs> and what it can get you. In the Springbok side, because geez, it, it definitely definitely favours your chances of, of of getting selected. Yeah, no, adversity is the name of the game. Um, at the end of the day, Sasha Fami Gomez would not have played. We would not be playing in a sixth test this weekend if he didn't. If he wasn't versatile, um, you know, if he was an out now number ten, um, you know, he wouldn't have had the opportunities he's had. He's had the opportunities because he could cover fifteen and he played there during the Ireland series. Yeah. Um, that he came on in at you know came on at ten for uh, against um, Wales, but could have been playing at twelve or fifteen. So it definitely gets you ahead of the game um, at the end of the day. And uh, you know somebody like Cock Smith's making a career out of it, out of being that impact player that can cover multiple positions. Yeah. Chesney Colby, for example, who's covering multiple positions. Um, Grant Williams, if he couldn't cover wing, probably wouldn't have gone to the World Cup last year. Um, yeah. Because they, you know, let's, that. Well, let's speak pop- about Grant Williams though, Stevie, because. Mm. He's only played two minutes of Springbok rugby with the number nine on his back being a starting nine. He's always come off the bench in every single other game he's played and continues to be kind of reduced to that bench spot, much like Quacha. And is it now a case where he, you know, everyone speaks about his speed when he comes on and the energy that he brings? And, you know, is that now just being looked at as the most effective thing to be used against high defenses, you know, breaking the line, you know, yeah. la- lazy forwards covering a little dart in behind. This is what we've come to see from him. But we've also just seen a much better Grant Williams than I think when he first came onto the stage. He's a much more complete scrum off and has benefited a lot from being in that park camp. Do you agree with him staying on the bench and playing that quacker role where, as you mentioned, he can obviously cover lots of different positions, including wing and, and, and scrum off, but should he be given the opportunity to start at nine? Yeah, I mean, it's an interesting one, isn't it? Uh, it's you, same thing with Archie Stammer, you know, almost these players, Vincent Cock, they kind of become these sort of perennial bench warmers, you know, type of thing because mm. um, of the impact they bring. And um, it's, it's an, he's an unfortunate player because, you know, when he, the one time he had a chance to start at Scratton off, he, you know, got knocked out within like 30 seconds of the game. Yeah. Um, I think that he we might see him start against um, Argentina. Um, I was quite surprised that he didn't get a start against um, against Australia, but yeah, I think at the end of the day, you know, I think it also it's, it's about attributes, you know, and I think you know your starting scrum off is 
uh, for the box tends to be a bit more tactically astute. Uh, and that's why you generally go on. So for example, Hirsch Young's in the same boat where he would always be off the bench in like your strongest mm-hmm. 23. If after Kirk gets injured, Kubis Rana suddenly comes in and starts. You know, yeah. Kubis has always been sort of our number two starting option. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, whereas Grant Williams is our number two scrum off in that, in our strongest team, he still makes the 23. So very, very interesting dynamics there. I think he's due a start. Um, but at the end of the day, I suppose it's the same thing as well. You know, if, if, when he is so effective off the bench, you know, does do you lose that if he starts? And it, I think also I think the problem is I think our scrum at the moment, most of them don't have nearly as much as effect off the bench. They won't be able to add the up the ante in the same way that he can yeah. if you're being on a Kubus Rauch in the second half or Jaden Hendricks, for example, or Faf de Klerk. Yeah, no, exactly. And I think we saw someone like Quacha you know, he struggled a bit in that Ireland series and this, him starting a day didn't really work. It, that impact that we have come to get used to with Kwapa Kwapa coming off wasn't felt over 80 minutes. And I guess perhaps there's that risk of seeing that, but I agree with you. I think being able to at least give him a chance in that starting jersey, I'd love to see it. And and perhaps it's also a case where, you know, last last week there was, or two weeks ago in the last Australia test, there was Mone van der Berg and Sasha, two inexperienced heads paired together didn't actually work that well both of them didn't have the best of their game so maybe it's going mm-hmm. back to okay well we definitely gonna we're gonna pick Sasha at 10 and we'll get into that now but you know we need to pair that with now an experienced scrum off and that is Kobus Reinoff you know um but let's transition into the the fly off debate and what you think about the um pick of Sasha at 10 I mean he was introduced to the box at 15 played three games there and now this will be his third game at 10 for the box where he really hasn't played much of club mm. rugby but is typically has been that has been his position coming through the ranks essentially you know Russi defending it saying we're not throwing him out to the rules we've wolves we've slowly gotten him to a point where he's now built up a couple caps and you know starting off with you know wales portugal you know, he was at 15 against Ireland as well. So that was a big test. And he had a really good game when he came off the bench for Billy. And now, you know, two starts against Australia. So does that warrant him being picked against, um, over Pollard? What do you see as this, you know, selection and, and one versus two going forward now? Yeah, look, I think it's, it's, we we want, I think it's I think it's, I think a lot of the Tony Brown influence to be honest. I think you know we want to have a playmaker at ten, somebody who brings more players into the game, um, which which he is, um, and he brings the goal kicking that he's got as well. So he's kind of that bridge between Pollard and Marty Liebach, um, who I still think you know with ball in hand and, and as a, as, a, as a, an attacking flower, I think Marty Liebach's probably still our best option. Um, but it's it's an interesting one. I think, you know, you look at the rest of the back line around him, they've so much experience between Jasper Wies, Kubis Ranach, you know, Damien Daly and Jesse Creel. Uh, there's so much experience around him, for example. So they very much, I think, I mean, look, at the end of the day, I think they've made the call and they said they're saying, this is the guy that's going to lead us at number 10 for the next World Cup. I think that's quite obvious um, if they can get as much, but they need to get it's as crazy much. crazy when you come to think of it, though, because Pollard, you would, Put still one making the next World Cup. My Leibach still making the next World Cup. You know, and, they, and they're still um, picking Sasha. So I mean, to see him take the jersey away from Pollard, we spoke yeah. a couple of weeks ago and said Pollard has the keys as long as he wants it, but we're not sure if he does now. He might no, actually think... be getting rivaled by Sasha, and it'll yeah. be fascinating now to see also what happens when Sasha and Money go back to the province because Dobson has now got something. You know, almost a a massive selection headache on his hands yeah. because Damien's going to he's he's playing 15 unless you always play Damien at 12 Sasha 15 you want your Bok 10 to be practicing and playing at 10 his whole you know club career so yeah, which, which, which is why Sasha has to come to the lines it's a very simple solution here <laughs> to be perfectly honest um you yeah, know, I mean, uh, we're, we're, for, the, for the sake of for the sake of the Bok rugby we, we're willing to, to, to make that sacrifice yeah, um, no, I mean, no, it's, we, massive, uh, it's a massive, it's a massive conundrum. I think the storm is going to have. Very interesting to see how they do deal with it. Um, yeah. From from a Bok perspective, I think that they they're looking at a generational player, and they and I think they're just thinking if, if we can get this guy up to speed, you know, mm. turn him into one of the best playoffs in the world as soon as possible. That's only going to make us better. We know what Pollard can do. We know what Mon Libok can do, for example. Mm. Um, mm. If we can get this guy operating, then we've got ridiculous depth at ten. Um, I yeah. think we might see Pollard at twelve actually come Argentina. We've yeah, got no Andre Esterhazen. 
Um, you know, he's and out also, for a while. So inside centers are not looking as stacked as we'd like them to be. Mm. In some sort of way, Sasha might be what everyone thought Damien Willemse was going to be. And that's not to, you know, diminish what Damien Willemse has done because he's become a, you know, top three fullback in the world. But mm. he was always a 10 coming through the ranks. And everyone yeah. saw him as the next top 10. And he played a couple of games there and he wasn't that impactful. He kind of needed a little bit more extra time and space. Could Sasha be that? And with Damien at the back, you know, similar pathways. Western Cape has always mm. been known through the ranks. Everyone's spoken about their name and known them from a young age. A lot prodigy, of pressure. Yeah. So, and, so maybe Sasha is that. And, and you know, if he, if he is, you know, lucky us. But, yeah, it's going to be a mammoth clash this weekend. Um, and I'm really, really excited to, to see how that goes. And a big one, of course, let's get into the last big selection, is Apalele Fassi over Vili LaRue. Um, yeah. How do you see that um, transpiring? Well, I, still, I think, again, that's the Sasha versus Pollard situation. You know, I think if Pollard starts, then you, you really do have to have Vili LaRue. Um, and uh, I'll guess analytics on Twitter, you know, show the, the comparison. Because somebody yesterday, I was doing my live stream, and I was saying that Fassi's not a playmaker. He says, what do you mean? Of course he's a, play- course he's a playmaker. And I said, but he's not in the Vili LaRue sense. He doesn't distribute. For example, he like Vili Rue does. As much as he, really. Yeah, exactly. He is a he's he's an attacking threat himself. He's a ball carrier. Yes. He makes meters, he makes more carries, he'll chip and chase, he'll score tries. He scores he more is tries, a... but he gives more assists. That's like correct. The simplest way correct. Of like, at. yeah, to, to bring it down to a nutshell, it's exactly that. And the stats show that, you know. Plus, I mean, literally, Fassi runs the ball twice as much as Vili Rue. Vili Rue literally passes the ball twice as much as Apple Fassi. So they're completely mm-hmm. different fullbacks. Um and I think that that's, that's, again, what you kind of bring with Sasha, who's got that creativity that you don't necessarily need that really extra uh, sort of playmaking ability. But so now you can add an, an attacking threat. It's kind of a bit like almost Damien Willems' situation with Mario Lieber. When Mario Lieber was playing, then Damien Willems all of a sudden could become this amazing fullback where he just, he could run with the ball in hand. He could you know, kick him behind. He could be that attacking threat himself and not be expected to kind of operate as a first or second receiver and create, um, you know, tries stuff like that, which what Vili Rue traditionally was doing in a spring box setup. So, it's all our combinations, really, and about finding the best way. How do we find out our best attacking output? And I think with Sasha at 10, you can afford to have a more ball-in-hand nature type of 15 mm. than, than a, a playmaker or distributor in, in Vili LaRue. Uh, I think Fassi's earned it. I think he's had a couple of, of good games. I don't think he's been as, as tested as we would like him to have been. Um, you know, he was phenomenal against Wales in the high ball, but he wasn't con- um, challenged yeah. a lot of it. He then played against Portugal, played against Australia, for example. So he's he very new in his test career. He's only playing, I think this is his seventh test. Um, this will be his test. Yeah, this this is, the is the first time he's playing against a genuine tier one top nation. Yes, he's played against you know, your Wales and your Australia, but look where they are at the moment, yes, you know, in, yeah. in, in their, in their, get, in their, right. yeah. So, you know, now he's playing against the top three side and he's playing against one of the best sides in the world. So I think Saturday is going to be a very big moment for him. He needs to prove that he can play at the highest of higher level. He's proven that he can play at test match level, but there's test match level and then there's test match level. And this is now an yeah. opportunity for him to say that he can play against the All Blacks, you know, the best, you know, traditionally the best side in the world. And this yeah. is the biggest game in the world. Absolutely, um, yeah. It's gonna be it's gonna be really exciting, and you know, I think the pressure doubles if we lose this game because that means they've already they would have, um, you know, the deficit will either be by one point or then or it will, will be equal depending on the results. So then it takes it to Cape Town. So I think it's an absolute must win game here um, for the Springboks, and then you've almost got one hand on the trophy um, at that point, you know, for for the rugby championship, and again, desperate to get that win in Ellis Park this shouldn't be a place where we allow people to come and and actually thrive so really exciting there Stevie let's jump into a bit of the Curry Cup and what has happened over the weekends we alluded to it earlier in our predictions but let's just go through some of the results again a struggling Griffins losing to the Pumas at home 26 points to 45 Cheetahs losing to your Lions who seem to be on a crazy hot streak Remember the name Renzo Jupiter C. He's just gone three man of the match awards in a row. Yeah, that's that's someone who we might be seeing in an alignment camp sooner or later. Yeah, province <clears throat> oh, giving me more and more headaches week on week. Twenty three points to thirty one. I don't know what it is about the Curry Cup, but we just cannot crack it despite all of our yeah. depth. 
And then the Bulls, a massive win to remain on top of the league, 47 points to 24 versus a, um, a struggling Greek was really. Um, yeah, Stevie, let, let's start off with your Lions and, and Renzo Duplessis. Do you, do you see yourself, obviously, you know, you're only three points behind the Bulls now. You're going up against them this weekend. Um, would you, you know, could you call yourselves favorites going into this game now with the form that you're taking in? Uh, probably not necessarily favorites. Um... Bulls have been playing some tremendous rugby, and I mean the depth they've got is scary. What's what I'm what I'm loving so much is that the Lions are doing it without so many big names um, because we don't have necessarily the depth other teams. But now I think people are starting to see somebody like a Randy Duplessis is coming through, Nico Stein, some very good young players, and the Lions are very unapologetically been kind of accumulating a lot of the the young talent across the country, and we're starting to really see it come out in in, in the Curry Cup. So I think mm-hmm. Bulls. Not necessarily. I mean, look, it's kind of a neutral ground on, on Friday. It's at Michigan College, so it's not at Loftus. So it's a home game for the Bulls, but not at Loftus. Um, I, I mean, I think the Lions go with a lot of confidence. I'm not sure they're serious favorites, but I think we're in for, for, for a cracking game because I think we've got two yeah. teams who are scoring lots of tries, playing very good attacking rugby. Um, the Yorkshire derby is always a good clash. Yeah. So, yeah, I think yeah. it's going to be actually crack up. I think the main thing for me as an Lions supporters, I'm looking at Puma sitting down 19 points, and we're pretty much all but booked through to the next round, which is the main thing. Um, like a home semi final. Mm. And if we have to then go across to, to Loftus for the final, well, I mean, that's that's really the final that we probably want. If you're looking yeah. at uh, the, the teams in and around the top four at the moment, a Bulls Lions Curry Cup final would be a really cool mm. occasion. Yeah. I mean, Cheetahs, where they started really strong, have really slipped down the log. Um, so it's tough to see them. So really, it has been the two form teams in the Lions and Bulls that are looking like it will be likely finalists. So it could be a little prequel to what could be a, a final later on. Um, and looks like it's going to be competing for one versus two. It's just whether, you know, Stormers or maybe the Pumas can get their heads out of their asses and try and challenge um, the Cheetahs or Sharks for that semifinal spot. But yeah, let's look ahead at some of those fixtures. We've spoken about Bulls versus Lions. We've also got Greekwas versus Sharks, which is going to be massive for the Greekwas in like, their yeah. charge for the semifinal at home as well, which is always big for them. Um, Sharks are going to be taking on the Griffins at home. They will see that as a way of just extending that lead and maybe even putting a little bit of pressure on the Lions um, for that mm. number two spot. And then Province versus Pumas, uh, two teams that are sitting outside of those um, you know, knockout positions and absolute must win. Stormers, I think they are three losses on the bounce now. So it's it's really has been a shocking season Curry Cup wise for them. But you know what I always love about the Curry Cup and it's why it needs to remain so strong, Stevie, is that they've always, you know, you spoke about Renzo Duplessis. Um even certain players, you know, from the Greekers and the Pumas have been having stepping up and it's so good to see these youngsters from a coaching and players perspective given the platform to be able to thrive. And the Curry Cup is looking strong, um, to be fair. So uh, that's all really good for the state of South African rugby. Yeah, 100%. I've really enjoyed the Curry Cup. It's, it's, it's been, we've been saying it every week. It's, it's just continues to be such a nice competition to watch. Um, it's nice to got a sponsor again. I do feel a bit of the magic's coming back into it a bit, even though the scheduling is still maybe a bit of an issue. But I think um, if we have another edition like this next year, I think it'll slowly start to regather the kind of the, um, the, 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 the attention and the kind of the prestige it once had. Yes. Um, you know, it needs. We need to accept that it is never going to be the Curry Cup in the traditional form. Mm. The, the rugby calendar just can't allow for it. Um, but it's still a really good product, and it's really exciting to see how many players are coming through. And it's acting as a nice preseason as well for the URC as well. So it's definitely got definitely got a, lot, a big role to play in, in South African rugby. Yeah, and I think if you also just look at South African rugby, that's the competition to win, especially given that we were in Super Rugby now in the URC. We haven't really built up a history of those tournaments, you know. Looking back mm. on, oh, I'm a URC winner. That doesn't hold a lot of gravitas quite yet. And it will over time once we're in that competition. Um, but everyone knows and everyone will speak of them being a Curry Cup winner, you know, as a South African rugby player. And all the greats have kind of done it. So it's also for you to go out and get there. No, no South African rugby player wants to retire without winning a Curry Cup. So I do think it still yeah. has that prestige in South Africa, and I hope it remains that way. And it does look like it's, it's continuing to go in that direction. Let's jump into the Premier League, TV. And we have had 
a game week two now. So a lot more mm-hmm. being revealed about the Premier League and where different teams are at. Yeah. Um, well, I'll start. Uh, as, as predicted, Bench United continue their woeful form <laughs> against Brighton. I think it's like four losses in the last five games, something stupid. Brighton are um, the definition of just, they're always the banana peel. Always, always. Yeah, Brighton no, they away are. is one of the hardest fixtures on the Premier League calendar, I'm telling you. Yeah, I think it's just, it's a, uh, yeah, no, it's a bit of a disaster, um, kind of, sort of, and a frustrating game. Again, I kind of watched it with sort of one eye, and I didn't watch the highlights. I mean, a couple of years, disallowed goals for United, so a different day, a different, you know, fraction of the second. Um, it, uh, it did demonstrate the fragility United have, especially in attack, um, mm-hmm. you know, got to try, and, and this is why we've been saying it's all very nice bringing in a big defensive midfielder in Yukata, who could be confirmed, hopefully, in the next couple of days. But um, still, plenty of issues up front. Yeah. Um, look, Brighton are a good side, and I think you know they're signing they're signing really interesting players this 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 transfer window as well. So I'm very interested to see the run that Brighton might be able to go on this with, this the, with their new 31 year old manager. Yeah. You know, it's a it's a very interesting project um, and a very good project. It's a well run club, um, and uh, I think they can go on it wrong. I don't think this will be the final final sort of scalp, so to say. Of, yeah. of the weekend. Um, it was an interesting weekend, though, because Tottenham, for example, is who, who got us to such a bad start, um, you know, were held against Leicester and, you know, all the issues. They then responded mm-hmm. with a 4-0 victory over Everton. So kind of, yeah. you know, putting all those kind of fears um, to bed. Other results, West Ham beating Palace 2-0, uh, Forest beating Southampton 1-0, Fulham beating Leicester 2-1. And then City versus Ipswich 4-1. Holland, who, you know, after rumors that he was potentially injured for however many weeks, coming and scoring a hat-trick. So yeah. RIP to the FPL managers who took him out. Um, yeah. No, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's he, a serious he, he outfit. He continues just side. to turn out goals. Um, yeah. I mean, yeah, well, we'll quickly get through the rest of the results. Arsenal getting that um, result 2-0 away to Villa. And that was, that was really a big show of character and it's starting to actually become quite normal for Arsenal where you feel like they actually aren't on top of games. You know, one big miss for Ollie Watkins in the first half and then a freakish save from David Raya for Watkins' header. Again, Watkins probably should have finished it, but I think you've got to give more credit to the goalie than take away from the, the shot because it was unbelievable. And then they go and kind of get a goal out of nowhere and then finish off the game with another winning 2-0. So Real, I think they've just managed to continue that form that we started to see yeah. from them in the last two seasons. So, and you, we all know it's going to be a mam- mammoth effort to try and beat City, and it's going to require 90 plus points. So, you know, is this an Arsenal that can continue to do that? But um, it'll be interesting to see if, if this is something that they continue to do going behind or not going behind the games, but, you know, being, you know, on the back foot but still getting results. And of course, yeah. Bournemouth, Newcastle. 1-1. One, one. Um, I think I've been very disappointed with Newcastle's start to the season. I mean, one win, one draw, maybe you shouldn't be, but and they did have a red card in their first one, but I would have expected them to get the win there with the amount with their with their team. Um mm. and then a massive blowout win for Chelsea, six two, and that comes off the back of um Pereska actually dropping half of his team. He essentially said Raheem Sterling's not playing. He said that Ben Chilwell, they all need to go find a new club. He says, I yeah. can't deal with 40 people. I can only deal with, you know, 20-something. And the rest have been isolated. They're not training with us because I can't work on this many people. Do you think this is the approach that Chelsea have finally needed to actually, you know, go ahead and make a bit of progress and a bit of cutthroat because... The owners are clearly making signings left, right, and center. I think I read yesterday they have eight goalkeepers, which is just absurd. Yeah. But does does Kareska and this approach is that the right way of doing it? You know, big names that he's leaving out though. Yeah, look, I think it's the only way of doing it when you've got a squad of that sheer size. You know, it it is far too big. They are signing far too many players. Um, I'm seeing some Chelsea fans try and like sort of justify it, saying, "Oh, but watch us in a few years." I I think it makes a bit of a mockery of the whole financial fair play system, to be honest. And I understand that you know they got that initially it was the whole um, amortization type thing, young players, long contracts, transfer yeah. fees paid in in different installments, installments yeah. stuff like that. So I mean, I think that's something that'll be cl- that'll be clamped down on in the future. So I think it's just ludicrous. Uh, it's always but Chelsea always been a bank of players they've always had 50 players on loan type of thing and um so you've got to trust you've got to, you've got to draw the line and say right this is my squad um you know who they're adding maybe a victor seaman if if they can get that over the line yeah. um but you've got to sit there and say right well I, I, as you said you can't wish 40 players these are my players 
I don't rate these players, therefore they're not going to be part of it. Yeah, um, I, I mean, do I think it's in the so Romelu still on their books. So they have a strike. They are, there, I mean, half, they they've got so many people that are on their books. Um, it's an interesting one. I don't, I mean, a lot of Chelsea fans are obviously getting very loud after a 6-2 victory against Wolves. For me, very, very early. Um, you know, it's the second game of the season. Yes, you know, it's Cole Palmer's back and playing well. Matty mm. Wicker, he scored some good goals. I mean, I mean, Kunku didn't even feature, really, on the goal yeah. sheet. Oh, he um, ruined my FPL on the weekend. He was yeah. benched as Smith Rowe coming on at 10 points and he played five minutes. Killed me. But, yeah, yeah, it'll be interesting to see what type of mix they get because the same thing. We started to see a bit of progression and, you know, Pochettino actually finished the season really um, well with Chelsea. And we yeah. started to get a little bit used to how they were playing and who was on that team sheet. Once again, we're back to the drawing board. You know, Mudaweke hack check. Is that a flash in the pan or is he actually going to be quite prominent going forward? Yeah. I think the big thing for them is that Cole Palmer stepped up because he was so central to everything that they did yeah. last season. And without him, I think they're in a big um, lot of trouble. But again, now they've sold Gallagher, who was probably their second best player last season. And, you know, what's that hole going to look like when? And then move on. So be interesting to see how they continue going forward. Um, and then Arnu Arne Slot getting his first win at home, two 0 versus Brentford. Um, I mean, as a Liverpool fan, happy two from two. I think he's the th- he's the first Premier League Liverpool Premier League manager to get the first two wins on the bounce in the last like since like the nineties or something stupid. Um, so good signs. We look decent on the break and. Honestly, it's like one of those seasons where the top three, top Champions League is mm. kind of what you're looking for. Anything more, maybe, you know, I would, would love a cup trophy. But he just kind of seems to have a bit of a no-nonsense approach. He's like, I'm not Jurgen Klopp. He's not trying to act like he's, you know, he's not one of those that kind of big up the crowd. He's not as big of a personality yeah. as Klopp, but seems to be going about his business in a similar way and kind of just wants to do his thing and is not afraid to make, you know, calls during the game. We saw he dropped Kwanzaa at half time in, in game week one and he just said, like, just bluntly, you know, oh, the only threat that Ipswich had in game one was that they were throwing the long ball deep and, you know, if Kwanzaa's not doing so well in the day and you have someone like Konate on the bench, I'm going to put him on because I believe that he can. Do yeah. That. So, you know, being able to make big calls and it's not like that he's burning bridges, but hopefully that this all continues to be successful for me at least. And obviously, the rail's all coming off this weekend, so don't stress. Exactly. Anyway, that's what yeah, let's, let's, let's focus on to the weekend because this is what we really, because I need to move very swiftly past last uh, last weekend after a bit of a shit show. Um, so, but it's actually a really, really cool weekend of fixtures. It is. It is. And the big one, Arsenal-Brighton. Of course, Brighton with the big result. And Brighton are just the, the banana peel team. And they were previously, back in the Neil Malpe days, always, always giving them headaches and always managing yeah. to get the win, over the, the win over them. Of course, there is, um, I think Chelsea-Crystal Palace will be a great game. Crystal Palace haven't quite got off to a flying start, but we know that they're really strong into last season and they've got decent players. Also just signed Eddie Nketiah. Newcastle Spurs is going to be massive. Now, kind of two teams with a win and a draw. So, where do they really sit in the scheme of things? And could one of them be charging for the top four spot? And then to finish off the weekend, Sunday, five o'clock kickoff. It doesn't get more iconic. Uh, Man United versus Liverpool. Stevie, what are you? What are you saying? What are your worries? Um, I think my worries probably kind of what they always are is that we are defensively not quite solid yet. Um, again, I'd be very surprised if suddenly we get a guard over the line and he starts. So obviously the midfield continues to be a bit of an issue. We've also got new defenders. You know, we've got the Licht, obviously, and you're injured. Not ideal. Masrari still sort of adapting. So I think it's going to take a while for us before that sort of is that, chemi- that chemistry between the the back four and, and, and even the back five, including Andre Nana. So I think that we are defensively still probably quite frail and we just not looked at We've looked, we're looking to create chances. You know, we've had chances. I mean, we scored goals against, uh, we should have scored more goals, should have won the Community Cup if you're being brutal chance against City. Um, had the chances there, Could, should have won 2 0 against Fulham, had a couple of chances there. So we're not, we haven't been finishing our chance, but we've been creating them. Um, I mean, I theory it's advantage Liverpool. I think it's, it's, it's a it, much better start to the season, looking a bit more solid all around. I do think that, as you mentioned, even if switches again, a bit of an issue. Uh, that, if United start well, we can get into Liverpool. If we played the first time we played in City, where I thought we played really well. But yeah. the problem with the United is that we just don't really know um, who's going to rock up on the day. Rashford rocks yeah. up and decides to have a worldie. You know, he could go and score two, three goals. He's got mm-hmm. that ability. Mm-hmm. But so can Mo Salah. 
So I think it's two teams who Liverpool being the more settled one, but two teams who I think this could honestly go any, either way. I think being at Old Trafford obviously gives United a big boost, but Liverpool definitely have the form obviously going into this. Yeah. And, you know, as you mentioned, it's still the beginning of the season. We're still trying to figure out, you know, once you have at least five games under the belt, you can see who, how they've done against different caliber of teams and you can start to really understand. Now it's like, is that just a flash in the pan? You know, you know, maybe we go one nil behind against Ipswich and then get that draw in the game. And then it's a big question mark in Liverpool and, and on it. So yeah. it's, it's all very new. I think it's fundamentally going to come down to can you, I think your defense is, you know, it's been okay, but can you prevent as many chances? And I think the big one there is, is Mo Salah and our um, counterattack. And then it's going to come down to how, we can deal with Bruno Fernandes and does Bruno have people running off of him that he can feed? Because honestly, it looks like he's the one that's most likely going to score nowadays. And that's mm. not actually meant to be his, you know, he's probably meant as a player meant to have more assists and goals. Um, and one of those players that can do both, which is why he's so, you know, such an influence in this Man United team. But he just needs that person up top. Um, is it Xerxes? Is it Rashford? Is it Diallo? Who is he feeding to be able to then get in behind the Liverpool? Yeah, no, I think it's yeah. As you, as you mentioned, you know, he is the danger man, um, and, and that's the thing. It'll be an exciting game because we know who the danger men are. For example, um, you know, and there's certain players that when they play well, the team plays well, and the teams I think are quite similar in that regard. You know, if if most other rock seven doesn't have a good day on on a Sunday, yes, you've got other players you can step in, um, and there are other players that you will bring goals, but you need your best player stepping up at the at the important times. Um, and similarly with United, if Bruno has a shock on a Sunday, it becomes yeah. very difficult for United to, exactly. to compete. Like, um, speaking you, of competing, yeah, and rather sorry. not competing, Dan, we're going to move on <laughs> to the cricket, is, is the Protests went and effectively had a decent test series and then a different squad basically just had a week holi- holiday in the Caribbean because not particularly brilliant cricket was played. No. Um, in this test no. series, we lost 3-0, yeah. losing by seven wickets, 30 runs, and then by eight wickets. Yes, by Doc Will Lewis, to be fair. But, um, Dan, a T20 series to forget. Mm, massively. And we went to West Indies before the World Cup. Obviously, that was a stronger team. I, w- I wouldn't call this a young team. I call it an experienced team. And there were a lot, mm. a lot of trials going on. Um, a lot of players missing. You know, we, we must acknowledge that there are a lot of players missing. There's yeah, no Dukak, Klaassen, Miller, Rabada, no Maharaj, Shamsi. No That's yeah. six players you all play in the T20 World Cup final. So exactly, yeah. Let's exactly. let's let's add that uh, that precursor. But yes, yeah, that, exactly. So you know, the only kind of you know people that we are used to seeing there was really Reza, Markram, and Stubbs these Stubbs. days. Exactly, um, and and, 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 and I mean, Arthur Bartman. Bartman was like leading the attack and he, and he he made his debut this year exactly so it is inexperienced but yeah i mean three three games to forget really we in all of them we kind of showed a promise the the first mm. one we managed to dig ourselves out of a bit of a hole and that was largely thanks to um um patrick Kruger and Stubbs, and they they were really the two that shone out the series but the second one, abysmal, got ourselves into such a good position to chase 179, having, a, yep. having had a strong start, needing 55 or 42 or seven wickets in hand. And then we just batted ourselves into a cave that we couldn't get out of and yep. go, went on to lose that by 30 runs. I mean, how from that position do you lose the game by 30 Yeah, I mean, runs? we were well ahead of the one run rate. I mean, that, that for me is an absolute horrific collapse. Um, horrible, and we horrible, were such a good Such a good power play. Reza Hem just played an absolute sterling knock. We were looking yeah. good. We were up on the run rate. And then to have lost that game is pretty, pretty childish. Mm-hmm. Um, and then the third game, frustrating, because, you know, we were, obviously, it was a, it was a shortened game. The conditions mm-hmm. changed so much after the rain. Uh, they, I mean, the, 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 I think the, the, the percent of spin was 1.9 degrees before the rain, and like 3.3, it almost doubled. Yeah. Um, after the covers were pulled out. And you could see, see by the first two overs, you know, Malcolm and Rickleton, and we, they couldn't touch the ball because the ball was moving so much. They then kind of got grips to it, um, and we ended up leveling a reasonable score, um, but we lost basically 12 balls as dot balls, which was just pure, okay, the conditions are completely different to what we were pl- pl- playing before. Um, yeah. So, you know, you go and add boundaries on half those balls, and you go and score 130-yard, for example, 
um, that can suddenly make things a little bit more um, more complicated for the West Indies. And they ain't got there very, very comfortably because they've got such good explosive batsmen. Many two balls, um, yeah. It always, I, I do think often it, it does favor the the chasing team on, on yeah. you know, reduced because the openers can go out and just swing for the fences. You have the exact same amount of wickets in hand, you know. Yeah. Our slow start just killed us. We were, I think, yeah. on like seven runs after three overs. It's like, you can't, you shouldn't be doing that in a normal T20 game, never mind a reduced one. So that yeah. kind of just, and then, you know, and then we had to straight, off, straight off the bat, basically, when we came back. So, exactly. yeah, we were always right behind. And it was a phenomenal innings by, by Tristan Stubbs, um, but it was never, never going to be enough. And then we don't, we've got, we don't have the bowlers at the moment mm. to, to defend mm. a 116. If you've got Shamsi, who goes and takes, you know, four for next to no runs, and Mario Arch, who goes for next, nothing, you can create that pressure, but we just didn't have, no. have the bowlers. Exactly. And let's go through the series and speak about a couple of winners and losers because it was a mix up of, of, players i think we were both in agreement that you know our south africa's at least player of the series was absolutely tristan stubbs and he's just continuing to prove that he is world class genuinely I tweeted last night he is going to make so much money i was just watching yeah. last night and he's so i was just like money. yeah he is going to make so much bank because he will get big ipl contracts he'll go and play in the major league cricket he'll get offers from the vitality blast he'll get offers from the hundred he'll yeah. get offers for the lunken premier league he, he'll be on a big sa20 contract he's gonna make all the money he is just stupidly good it'll be interesting to see how he actually balances that because i think we've spoken about him being the most talented cricketer since ab de villiers that south africa has had and ab de villiers at least towards the end of his career realized listen started picking and choosing the competitions he wanted to play mm. in there's obviously an unbelievable test odi and t20 player the best you know of all three formats that we had in this generation and Stubbs is looking to potentially be the same obviously very new into his test career and we haven't seen the yeah. best of him there but you mentioned everyone is going to be throwing money at him to come to their um t20 yeah. you know league all around the world no matter where it is no matter what time of year that he's going to have an offer to go and play somewhere and it's going to be big money because he's going to be he is a star so yeah. i want it's going to be interesting to see how he does going forward and how he prioritizes that with south african cricket and with test cricket you know being deprioritized by um cricket south africa in terms of how many games it's being given you know does he still continue to actually commit to that or he mm. say well i'm not playing that much test cricket maybe i just you know i'm, a, I'm an odi cricketer because I mean, he's absolutely box office, and it's no doubt, at least at this stage, that's where his where most of his talent is. Yeah, look, the nice thing about him is he's got a real good head on his shoulders. He just seems to be a guy that loves his cricket. Absolutely. You know, I mean, they'll ask him like, "Oh, what's what's, what's the extra money? What are you going to spend?" And he's like, "I don't know. I think it's in my parents' account." And he didn't even like know what was spot. Yeah, you know, he just he's not he loves his Ferrari. cricket. He, yeah, you know, he wants to play test cricket. He says that that is his pinnacle. You know, he wants to win a World Cup for South Africa. You know, so mm -hmm. ODI cricket will be a big priority for him. Like, he'll want to be, at the moment, where his position, he's looking 2027 World Cup in South Africa saying, that's my World Cup. Yeah. You know, the, the World Cup we just saw by Travis Head, like last year and stuff like that, he's saying, that needs to be me in 2027. I need yeah. to be the guy that wins us that World Cup. Mm -hmm. I can guarantee you right now that'll be on his mind because he's got the talent to do that, A, and he's the kind of person, he's the kind of competitor he wants to be that that person. You can see, I mean, every time in the series when he goes out, I mean, he went down like 40 of like 12 balls and he's like punching his bat, he's fuming. You can just see, he's like, yeah. well, I've got two more balls, I've just wasted. Yeah. He is so and ultra competitive and, at, and he plays at such a high level that yeah. I think that he'll play IPL and I think he'll play maybe like a major league cricket, but I think he will never say no to a test series in the next few years. We can and I think he'll try and play as much ODI cricket as possible. He's also, two things. First of all, he's not old. He's still pretty young. He's also a batsman. So longevity-wise, he can play a lot longer mm -hmm. than, you know, something like an underfield yeah, care. He's now had a bad injury. He's now saying, listen, I've got limited time here. I've got to, I've got to cash in yeah. while I can. Exactly. Stubbs has far more time and far more, um, you know, yeah, it's like work with having a, a longer career. Yeah, yeah exactly. For sure. for sure. And geez, may we continue to speak about him, about him being the best player in, in many series to come. But the next yeah. one is Patrick Kruger, and he batted alongside Stubbs, particularly in that first one, getting us from a really bad place. I think we were about 40 for five or something, and they dug us out of a hole. Contributing with the bat and ball, Patrick Kruger, really one of actually the more in inexpensive bowlers where everyone else was just going for absolute an absurd amount of runs and super handy with the bat and you know he he stepped up in the SA20 he's been given the nod here and you know 
man from Kimberley coming up and it was funny because they were speaking about you know in the England test series you know this I forget who they were speaking about but he's from Essex he's he's going to be hard as nails I was like bro you don't know Patrick Kruger and Patrick Kruger from Kimberley you know this yeah, like, no, he's, listen, he's, listen. A, he's he'll take you to the dog box and he'll flip and go there happily and he'll clean you because he's such a farmer's league like bully he just he's yeah. strength he hits ball. the ball so hard so he, like hard. We, we've we've all played against farmers who they just got a different type of strength that the sound the ball makes it's barbaric yeah it's the best and way you worry about it. the car park you know what i mean he's one of those oaks you where, where yeah, you your captain goes and tells you to go stand a short cover and you, you, you say no no i'm not yeah. i'm not <laughs> i'm not i'm not dying and playing sunday league cricket no not, not worth my future kids um, correct yeah but then a couple of players or well, the big i guess losers that we're framing it for the series. Um, I think the big one to mention is Rusty van der Dussen. And, yeah. you know, he is now being not selected for a T20 World Cup. He's at the end of his career. He's at least 33, 34 now. And is still getting picked for international series. And it seems like he is playing, you know, the senior figure, creating a bit of a spine in the team. But fundamentally... He de- isn't being played in the right position. He's used to being an opener in T20 cricket. He isn't being put there. He's batting at five. He bats slowly. He takes a while to get in. And he was, you know, probably the biggest reason that we ended up losing that second game. He dug us into a hole. And mm. it always looks good when he's able to get us out of it. But it often takes him 15 balls. So when you do go out on your way to kind of ramping up your innings, you've actually wasted it. And I just don't think it's a s- sustainable um, technique or, or way about building your innings now in t- test cricket. It's just not how you can do it nowadays. You have to be able to switch it on right from the get-go. And, you know, it's disappointing because I think he's really taking the positions of someone like, you know, Vian Mulder, um, Jason Smith, Donovan Ferreira, Bretzka. They all had to sit out certain games. I mean, Bretzka wasn't even on tour with them, but I would have rather yeah. seen Bretzka play the two games that Rusty didn't. Or, you know, Jason Smith, who only played one game you know, and, and got minimal time because of rain. Now, he, we don't really know what he's made of. Vian Mulder only got one game, faced one ball. Pereira, unfortunately, missed out on his two opportunities. So, less so there. But he's just, I think he's taking up space and he's not even in the position he's meant to be. Yeah, I think that's the frustrating. I think, you know, if you're going to take him over, take him as an opener or top three batsman. That's where he had a very good SH20. That's where he had a very good um, Pakistan Super League. You know, back him in the position where he's been successful because otherwise, what's the point, you know? Uh, so I don't think we'll see him much again. Um, he's been a T20 shirt. I think, you know, he'll move back to ODIs being his, his priority, which is mm. fine. He's a phenomenal ODI he's a player. phenomenal ODI player, exactly. Um, but yeah, I think I agree. Uh, yeah, just just seen a bit of a waste. Other losers, Donovan Ferreira didn't really take his chance. I mean, I think keep around. He's, he's you know, the talents there. Just another, to get another time is league bully. Just smokes yeah. the ball. Yeah, Hits the ball fun. stupidly hard. Like, I mean, Adam, yeah, sorry, continue. Yep. Yeah. No, no, yeah, no. I was just saying, like, Ferreira, it's just he's there's there's so much talent there, and we've seen it in the IPL at times. We've seen him at SA Twenty that there's there's a player there worth keeping around because if you get him right, he's going to be stupidly good. Mm, mm. He's like, you know, what he reminds you of? He's a, he's a Justin Kemp, just yeah. someone who comes in a proper just bottom hand hits it hits a long ball. You know, I actually actually kind of see him and Patrick Kruger fighting for that position. You know, maybe they are the next, you know, the next generation of David Miller being that finisher that that, yeah. that is in late. Um, so it'll be interesting to see who that next is. I mean, Miller's not retired yet, but certainly at the back end of his career. Yeah, 100%. Um, and then Maiden Markham had a bit of a iffy um, series. He scored a few rounds. It looked good at times, but just didn't quite capitalize yeah. um, on it. But uh, Dan, speaking of sort of South African things, the Paralympics starts uh, tonight. In fact, it's the opening ceremony. We're recording this on Wednesday. And uh, we, we do well in the Paralympics. We've got plenty of medal hopes, um, mm-hmm. which, which, is, which is good to, to see because, yeah, we need, we need, we need to have a, a very good Paralympics on the back of a, of a reasonable um, Olympics. Um, but basically, yes. we're going to go through some of the, uh, uh, some of the, the, the medal hopes, for example. Um, the big news, we will have a schedule for hopefully have a calendar for you guys by tomorrow of all the different events and stuff like yeah. that. We have taken 31 athletes by our count um, over to Paris and things get underway um, tomorrow. So, yeah. Well, Steve, yeah, let's I mean, start so look- off by quickly doing a little recap of how we did yeah. last Olympics because I think that, oh, Paralympics, excuse me, because that's always a, a good place to start. I mean, 
last time we ended up four golds, one silver and three bronze, which I mean, that would be our best ever Olympics haul. So yeah, a really, a really strong one there. The athletes who got that, that was, um, um, and Rune Veyas, he is unfortunately retired now. Ntando Mashlangu, who won the men's long jump, unfortunately won't be at this Olympics. He won two goals, so he won the long jump and the 200 meters. Unfortunately, last year he went through a car accident and actually broke his neck. So he is now back running. He's actually studying at, at Loughborough University here in the UK, but not enough to get selected for the Olympics. So real tragedy that he won't be there but glad that he's obviously back i mean he got those two gold medals when he was in matric so a really strong talent and hopefully one that will you know be able to bring in some more medals in the future just a real pity that obviously as a result of this accident you know he's missing out on the on the pinnacle event um now but plenty of time to come for him so he brought in two of our four goals last one nicholas duprea and of course, he is going to be competing again this year. Stevie, he is just around the corner from you, I believe. Mm. Yeah, I know. I see him training all the time. He lives in the same um, uh, place that I do. So I often see him on his, on his, on his four wheels, got a little flag in the back. Uh, so you can sort of see him if you're driving. But uh, yeah, I mean, he's won multiple golds at World Championships, for example. Won gold in, in, in Tokyo. Mm. So hopefully you'll see back-to-back goals from him as well. Exactly. And then we have um, Lusan Kutsia in the women's um, 1,500 meter. She'll be competing again. Hopefully, she'll be in the marathon and the 1.5. So she won silver um, in the 1.5 and bronze in the marathon. So let's make those two, two um, golds now. And then the last one is Cheryl James in the athletics. But she has since retired. Stevie, let's get into... So those are existing... I think medlers from last Those time, lot, and obviously yeah. the big ones there are um, San and um, you know Nicholas Dupre, who we will be looking out for. Um, let's get into the rest of them. Let's start off with um, Hatsu Monchane, who just came off the back of winning Wimbledon doubles. Stevie, mm. yeah, I know uh, one of our top, top, top tennis players. I mean, our, our, our golden girl really when it comes to tennis. Um, mm. yeah, so, and she's. Uh, in theory, I haven't seen the schedule, but I think you're supposed to be doing the singles as well as the doubles. So she'll be playing on the risk of fences in, in, in the doubles, but I think in the singles, um, just trying to see um, it, the, the Olympics listed have, as having it on the um, on her events, but um, doesn't have the, the schedule yet. But I think she'll be a big medal favorite when it comes to that um, that that individual. Um, and yeah, I'll be, this is the kind of... Uh, Olympic medal, I mean, Paralympic medal is huge as well. I mean, to win Wimbledon as well, she's really putting, um, you know, South Africa para, para tennis on the map, which is good mm. to see. Um, and uh, but now she's going in with with a bit of a target on her back, which is always quite cool. It's nice to see that you know we don't. We, I'm bored of South Africa. Always, medals always been like the, the shock medals. Um, yeah. you know, yeah. it's, it's, it's like, nice I want to see, I wanna see the... us walking in this favor. It's coming out with a gold, yeah, you know, exactly, exactly. And, and what's nice about these big events when we watch is we get to know these types of names. She put obviously her name right on top of everyone's kind of, you know, newsfeed when she won Wimbledon. So now it'll be awesome to see if she backs it up. And obviously, well, we've just seen recently, she lost her mother, which is obviously incredibly difficult. So if not anything doing it for that reason and really being a kind of an inspiration to everyone else and we wish her all the all the best of luck with that would love to see her and mariska get some success in the doubles there um but then we of course have our flag wearer kat swanapool she'll be competing in the 50 meter backstroke and the 200 im and yeah she's had a lot of success at different world championships she um last year won gold at the world champs in the individual medley and another gold in the 50 meter backstroke so hopefully that means she can take home she's also got in 2022 she won two silvers and a bronze also in the individual medley and the back the, the breaststroke and the backstroke so hopefully we can turn those world championship medals into now paralympic um records because that would be that would be amazing um for her who is also a former wheelchair basketball and wheelchair rugby player yeah no I mean, that's pro- pro- proper proper sports person that um exactly. so um yeah and we've always been pretty well in the pool when it comes to the paralympics um mm. obviously 
Natalie all those years ago, really putting us on the map. Um, and what, a, what, a, what an absolute legend of, um, she was. Yeah. Um, and then uh, another one of our flag bearers is Mpumledo Mpongo, who is a world record holder in the T44 100 meter, 200 meter, um, and long jump, and a pa- as well as a Paralympic Games record uh, holder. Uh, he was actually the 2024 winner of uh, Athletics South Africa Sportsman of the Year with a disability. Um, he won a gold in the 2024 uh, Athletics World Championships in Japan, the Paralympics Championship, um, and he won the 100 in a time of 11.34. So um, that is absolutely he, yeah, good. he's quick. He is is quick, fast, and this is a is a proper medal. Uh, contender as well for us so hopefully he has a, a really strong games as well because um, yeah. we, we want to win the, in, the, in the athletics don't we exactly. in the Paralympics Olympics it's it's, it's the really want to win the medals yeah the athletics medals always just seem to hold somehow a little bit more weight and there's no disrespect to the other events because we want everyone to achieve in everything but you love it you love seeing just you know like fundamentally just someone who's absolutely blitz doing well but to, yeah. to clarify, because we we're also a little bit confused, because um, you know, and Pongo, who has the um, world record for the one, two, one hundred, two hundred, and long jump in the T forty four category, he had, didn't actually. He came fifth in his um, in the actual Olympics last time, and that's because there isn't always a medal for every single disability class. So he'll run with other disability classes, and obviously that. You know, there's a whole lot of different criteria for that. So he came fifth in the last Paralympic, but in doing so, breaking his disability classes record. So, um, which is a single below the knee amputation um, for an athlete who can walk um, with moderately reduced function in one or both legs. So that's what he qualifies for. But hopefully he can now go and win a medal as well. Yeah, and then finally, last of the medal hope is Peter Dupree is back after that gold in uh, in the 2020. Um, so, yeah, looking to defend his title, really. Um, and as mentioned, multiple um, golds in previous world championships as well. So uh, he is a man of good form. He's been doing this for a long, long time. And... Um, yeah, we'll be over there. So in terms of the schedule, um, yeah, we things will start off tomorrow. We've got uh, Sean Anderson involved in para archery. Um, he gets the the game's officially underway. Lots of different people um, involved over the next few days. So what we will do is we will have a link as we did last time of all the events for a calendar that you can go and check out. Um, lots of stuff happening over the next uh, sort of week and and a and a bit for the Paralympics. And yeah, I think, I think we're going to see a lot of success from there. Speaking Mm -hmm. of success, Dan, it is time for a new start to the predictions and uh, race to five. Let's do a race to five. Race to five. None of this 15 right. nonsense. Um, let, right, let, race let, to five, and, and and maybe we'll chat about a new forfeit as well, or whether we're going to keep the forfeit the same. Yeah. Um, so we'll confirm that for next week. But, Dan, we've got three things to predict. It's box versus all blacks. It's United versus Liverpool. We've gone with Bulls versus Lions. Box versus all blacks. Do you have a name and a number in mind? I do, Stevie. I do. Can't right. just down if you have one. Right. Um, yeah. Okay. Three, two, one box by box seven. Two. You close, close. I almost said four. But I think two, two is the number. Could come down. Two like the number. Down to a kick. Um. Yeah, I think that's going to be it's going to be box office as they call it. Fair enough. Right. United versus Liverpool. Heart over over mind here. <laughs> um. Do you do you do you have a score in mind? I have a score in mind, Stevie. Right. Three, two. One, two, two one United. Liverpool. Well, I didn't get you. What did you say? I said two nil Liverpool. Two one. Two one United. Sorry, yeah. my bro. That's when the, the 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 heart is speaking loudly on that side. Um, yeah, yeah, no, it's, it's fine. It's <laughs> let's see where your heart is on this one because you've got a lot of skin in the game here. Bulls versus yeah. Lions. Um, as we spoke about earlier, have you got a score in mind for this one, or at least a, a margin in mind? I do. You count us in once again. Okay, three, two, one. Lions, lions by, by five. Two. Interesting. Yeah. So we're both on lions. I, I do think their their hot form is going to benefit them. They've yeah. been unbelievable. They're really been. So and I also good. think, and I also think that it's neutral. basically a neutral neutral mm-hmm. ground as well. I think that'll mm-hmm. take a lot away from the Bulls. For sure. Um, and I think Renzo Dupes is about to drop another masterclass. So we move, we move. Yeah. Right, people, that is it for the week. It's been another cracking episode. 
Um, thank you very much for, for sticking along and send this to all your friends and family. Lots of stuff to talk about. And uh, yeah, lots of stuff to look forward to this weekend. Absolutely. The rugby championship's back, Prem's back, and we don't have to worry about the Proteas uh, losing. And the Paralympics is here. So lot to love. Lot to love, Stevie. Thank you very much for the episode and everyone for listening. Please do like and share with those who you think will also enjoy it. It really helps a lot grow what we are doing here. Um, but otherwise, Stevie, until next week, and you'll find out what I'm wearing um, when you tune in then. Yeah, cool. Brilliant, everyone. We'll see you soon. Cheers.